Hi, my name is Robert Forström, and I work as a application server platform architect at Volvo Cars. Uh, today, I'm going to take you through how we transformed our old Java EE service to become new, fancy, shiny, with containers instead. So, we, use, we deliver Java EE application servers. Uh, a couple of months ago, we had 785 applications on 560 application servers, all running on 80 physical servers, so a fairly large environment. Uh, our environments have to be stable all of the time. Uh, our manufacturing plant uses applications in the platform, our uh, maintenance uh, all over the world. Uh, are also using it uh, to service cars. And, but, so we've been delivering this service for roughly 15, 16 years, something like that. Uh, everybody knew how to operate it. Everybody knew how to use it. It was well known within the organization. But we started getting into problems. Uh, we built our whole infrastructure on physical servers. And all of a the sudden, uh, there was this magical thing. IBM would uh, give a deadline for one of their earlier versions. That meant for us getting new servers in pl into place, maybe get a guy out to drill a hole between the data centers to get a fiber optic cable between them. It was a moment of panic. Everybody has to change this, uh, the Java version, go up to the next Java EE version. It wasn't that good. Uh, we couldn't go to the cloud. We tried. Uh, and we had problems getting service windows for our platform as well. It had to be up and running uh, if we're running late on, uh, on delivering cars to our customers, then the plant had to be open. Our platform had to be up and running on our Sunday evening, that is, Japan's Monday morning when our Japanese customers were in their car going to the dealership to get the Volvo serviced. It was a huge issue. Our, our service was also built on physical servers. That means that after about six to seven years, we couldn't guarantee that our test environment looked exactly like a QA, a QA environment that looked exactly like our production environment. It was hard, almost impossible to replicate production issues because the um, the, the servers would have had people logged into them doing changes, doing maintenance work, fixing stuff. It was a huge issue. So we also had a problem with calendar time. It took us a couple of weeks to get our environments into place. That com uh, with also with, uh, with us being a couple of versions of uh, Java EE application server versions back, started to become, become a big issues, issue with our development, uh, uh, development organization because they couldn't use the latest, and fans, the latest fancy um, Java frameworks. So, uh, we started designing a new platform. Our first thing was always offer the latest version of Java and Java EE. Our developers had to get the latest version. We didn't want to, well, if it was supported, if the Java and Java EE version was supported, we were going to support it. However, if you're starting a new project, we don't want you to use three, uh, a Java version, that, version that's three years old. We had to go to multiple locations worldwide, being on uh, every plant in the world, and also into the cloud. Our platform had to be modern, fast, and also had to be able to adopt to changing requirements. There are always going to be new services out there. It's always going to be new frameworks that comes along that our development organization wants to use. And we, as a platform provider, needs to provide that for them. So when we started with the platform, uh, platform work, we wanted to isolate everything. A misbehaving application shouldn't be able to uh, take down the whole server. Immutable, that means it's going to be the same image that you build in your development environment that goes to test, that goes to QA, that goes to production, 
and even to the cloud, it's going to be the same image. Can't be any different uh, between the uh, different versions, well, the different environments that you're, you're in. Idempotent, everything that we can't use immut immutability with, such as uh, servers and so on, we use uh, idempotency. That means that we describe a wanted state. For, insta for instance, Ansible is what we use to do our idempotent scripts. We describe an end state. For instance, uh, I want this chair to lie down. There's a chair over there. And the only thing is that it's in the wrong state. Uh, with normal templating, we would have to go out, go to IKEA, buy a new chair, uh, build it, and put it there. But if I, using an idempotent language, describe that all I want is that chair to be down on the floor, the script will actually do it for me. So, uh, we started off by looking at how it worked. So, we started off by saying that our platform is stable and our customers trust us and the platform. That's really important. Uh, if, we, if our uh, customers, our internal customers, doesn't trust us, then we have a problem. We approach everything in a scientific way. We, we test things. We like to experiment. And if it works, then it works. If it fails, then we know it fails. We are transparent with what we do, what we deliver, and how. This, with everything's code, even infrastructure, is a really important thing. Because we want, my end goal somewhere, is to have a document describing the whole environment with everything as that is included, so that if there's a major incident, then I can bring up your environment here, show it to you in code. If I want to replicate your environment anywhere in the world, I just use the same bit of code, just put it on a different place. So that's really important. We communicate through APIs, mainly RESTful APIs then. So this was how we started everything. Uh, we started looking at virtual machines. Well, with virtual machines, we can automate everything. We get isolated environments. We can run different versions of Java at the same time. However, our 80 physical servers became 850 virtual servers. That's a hefty price tag because we pay per operating system instance. And the configuration is only known directly after provisioning. After we've been running your application for a while, then things that might have changed inside your virtual machine. We can't have that. So, looking ahead as well. So, we deliver, monolith we deliver environments for monolithic Java applications. So, they're huge. They're really huge. They're not really intended for running a container. However, we're putting them into a cont container because we want to have an environment where we can put our huge monolithic applications, and then have a way of slowly breaking them up into microservices if that's needed. And I think that microservices is one of the cornerstones of DevOps as well. So, our second draft was containers. Uh, with that, we have the possibility to automate everything. We got isolated environments. Well, you guys know everything about this. Uh, well, we use less hardware and the configuration is known at all time. So, we set on three products. The first one is OpenShift. It provides the build, distribution, runtime environment. We actually use it to distribute to the cloud as well. It's been designed with the developer in mind. And this is, this is really important. It's got really nice APIs that we can use. Because we want to create a self-service portal. Our, the platform doesn't only deliver an open shift environment to our end customers. It also includes things like load balancers and maybe in the future database uh, information and so on. So we just wrote a bit of a wrapper around it uh, to provide a GUI for our development and operation guys. So the next product we choose was Ansible Tower. With that one we can automate everything. It's idempotent, and 
it also has ni nice APIs, RESTful APIs that we can create optimization to. We use it to create and manage component outside OpenShift, and we also, in some cases, actually use it to build container images. And we also use it to manage OpenShift. So this is how our new environment looks like. There's not a lot of difference for a developer because we, get, uh, we changed the operating system version. Uh, the clustering capability has been taken over by Kubernetes and OpenShift. Uh, we run virtualization on Docker, and, but we changed the application server from network deployment to Liberty Profile. Liberty Profile was the first Java E7 certified enterprise application server. So we put that in there, and on, the, on top of that, we put in an air file. Uh, the difference here is um, for a Java E eShop, it's that the application server, the new version, Java E7, doesn't support JAX RPC and a couple of other frameworks. Uh, so we had to get rid of some of, uh, of the old technologies used, but that's just a sanity thing to remove old stuff that has become optional in the standards. But for a developer and operations personnel, this, was, this wasn't, well, for operation it was a bit of a difference, but for the developers it wasn't that much. So we actually had to take a look at our application deployment process. It looks, looked like this. So we got a developer checking in hello world.java to our subversion or git. Goes to Jenkins, gets built, goes into Artifactory. Artifactory is a glorified FTP server. Uh, down, to the <laughs> down to the developer. Uh, the developer then takes the artifact, creates three different deploy packages. Three. They're all different. They got all different configuration. Uh, it points out databases, there might be a properties file somewhere deep inside the application that was changed. Puts that on three different file storage, uh, NAS drives. That is, and for test and QA, they're uh, automatically deployed. But for production, it, ha it has to go through ServiceNow, which is our uh, incident uh, request handling system, to an ops guy. And I need to inform them four days ahead that we're gonna do a production deploy. Then it goes to the actual environment. This isn't really uh, continuous, this doesn't really support continuous deployment. So we had to redo it. This is how it looks now. Everything is the same until we go down to OpenShift. In OpenShift, we build an image, we put it into the test environment, we don't deploy to QA, we don't deploy to production, we promote, it's the same image that goes from test to production. But what about resources? Uh, so in the test environment, I wanna go to my test databases, test queue managers and so on. In production, I wanna go to my production test, uh, production queue managers and production databases. So we actually introduced a templating language based on mustache syntax uh, that our development teams are using when they're configuring their files. So anything that's environment specific, they will uh, fix that in the configuration files. And then before we start up the application server, we scan, the, um, scan for those files and then automatically change them. So we got the same image throughout the whole process. It's only that the environment configuration has been changed. So, our build process, uh, this is basically it. Uh, we take the latest version of Liberty Profile, put it into a Docker image, our development teams take an air file and a configuration file. The, the configuration file basically tells us where the databases and those kind of things are uh, with mustache syntax, put it into Artifactory, and then uh, we just combine the two and put it into the Docker registry. So I'm just gonna check for time, yep. So we're doing cloud deployment as well. Uh, so we automated everything here at VCC in Torslanda. <laughs> what we did was, it was really easy. We basically took the same optimization scripts, rewrote them a bit to have them provision Azure infrastructure, 
and then run the scripts there. So um, all of a sudden we had the same environment, the same OpenShift installation up in the cloud as we did have uh, on-premise. And the Docker registry was just connected. Well, we didn't connect it. We used an Ansible playbook to push out the information, uh, to push out the images to, to the different cloud locations. Uh, when we started this, um, Red Hat uh, wasn't supported on um, Microsoft Cloud. Uh, about two, uh, I think it was about two months before we actually go in, uh, got into production, they started supporting it, which was really good. Uh, but this is basically how it worked. It was really easy because we virtualize on, uh, on the OpenShift layer. So we define our infrastructure inside OpenShift so we can have replicate the environment anywhere in the world, any cloud provider. Uh, we can be, uh, be on N in any plant. We can be behind a, um, behind a parking lot uh, on, um, on the receiving goods part in Shanghai if we wanted to be there. We can, we can deploy our solution pretty much anywhere. So, looking ahead, uh, we actually started, we, we have automated everything in our platform. Everything's there. Uh, but we have a problem uh, because the rest of our, our organization hasn't been automated. So we're driving a, a hard agenda against our other people. For instance, if the, the business cases are there, you can do the calculations. I think that uh, if we were to use the normal processes just to, uh, to get our 80 applications, we're moving 80 applications into our solution. Uh, or 80 application portfolios into our solution uh, before Q1 next year. Uh, and I did a small calculation on that. And in order to get the load balancing uh, thing, um, get everybody, get the load balancer configured uh, as we do with the normal process, it would take us roughly 30 years to get that. So we just, that, that is a good business case. Then we just have to tell the right people and we will also help them automate their service. The same with authentication. So we, we started off with the application platform and now we had to, we're starting to expand to automate everything so that I can get my end results, which is a document that describes your whole application environment. Because I think that's, that's really, really important. It, uh, when, when you've done that, that you have automated everything. You have moved into to a position where, where your ops guys doesn't have to sit and press next, 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 finish, now I'm done. What they can do is deliver value higher up in the stack, go out, talk to the application projects, uh, be more involved with, uh, with, uh, with the parts that actually, actually creates something. So, so to summarize, um, we built our platform on uh, OpenShift using Ansible that ties everything together. It's deployed on-prem and in Azure, and we're using uh, WebServer Liberty Profile as, a, uh, as our application server platform, our application server engine. So are there any questions out there? Yeah. Oh, yes. Hi, this is Said Simnani from Deutsche Bank. Um, it was an excellent presentation, and oh. naturally, it's all interesting when people talk about something which is productive. So, you mentioned, I think, 787 applications, 700 app servers, 80 hosts. I know that we discussed lots of interesting things. Are you saying that all these 780 applications are actually running now in production on OpenShift? Uh, no, uh, not, all, not all of them. Uh, 
but uh, Web Server Application Server are getting, uh, um, are getting the, the version that we're running on our 80 physical servers mm -hmm. of Web Server Application Server is going out of support Q1 2018. Mm -hmm. And by then, that's the, this is the major platform that, we're, uh, that we have for our development teams. However, uh, we've been running in production for us uh, since August last year. Uh, with a global application in this, but we have the uh, so we know it works, and uh, okay, I, I think we're running six applications at this okay. time in production, and a number of other ones in testing QA that hasn't made it up to the production level. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Bjørte Karlsen from the Norwegian Tax Authority. Hello. And I'm wondering how you're doing the, the uh, how do you transition the, the image from test to QA to production? Uh, using uh, OC tags, if it's an internal environment, uh, if it goes out to the cloud, we're doing doc docker pull, docker push. Okay, so, so it's manual, you have to do a manual process to do uh, it? Yeah, the, 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 fir the first thing, uh, you know, for our first iteration, it was Ansible scripts uh, running inside Tower, so we had a basic UI that was doing it. Uh, but now we actually developed a, a portal. Our platform is called MASP, Modernized Application Server Platform, and for that we obviously have a operation portal called MOPS. Uh, <laughs> I and like uh, based, on, based on the latest technology, like uh, RESTful services, Node.js, and those kind of hef uh, cool things, uh, Angular material. Uh, so we, we built this little interface, and now our customers, our internal customers, are using that to, to handle their environments. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I wanted to know if you use one OpenShift cluster or more than one. Uh, multiple. We even have a, we're, when we're going to. We actually we have started uh, doing release based. Uh, uh, so we got an A side and a B side um, for our next release. This is the first one we're doing this with uh, because we got so many customers and so much volume. Uh, that one mistake in, a, in an upgrade script for our environment would have disastrous consequences. So we're not risking that. Uh, what we do is have a B A side and a B side. And the application can be in both sides at the same time in different environments. So you can run your test QA in A environment and production in B environment. They got different versions of uh, OpenShift. So we got at least two clusters and then we have uh, uh, multiple cloud sites, four mul uh, cloud sites uh, at this time, and then we have one uh, based on network zones. So I think we're up to eight clusters right now. Yeah, okay, you then have uh, eight clusters for different failure domains, but do you, for instance, uh, deploy uh, testing, Q&A, and production in the same cluster? Yes, we do. Yeah. And that's to make sure that you have the same environment, I presume. Yeah, you know. same environment. Yeah. Because uh, we d given that we're doing releases of the, of the applications or platform, and in a release it's OpenShift, the latest version of OpenShift, often the latest version of OpenShift, uh, latest version of the, the operating system, uh, monitoring agents, and so on. So, um, uh, we, we all, sorry, what's the question? <laughs> Yeah, that you uh, run everything, uh, production, Q&A, testing yeah, yeah, yeah. in the same so, cluster. So we're running everything yeah. in, in the same cluster. However, we do have dedicated uh, VMs yeah, yeah. Uh, for production load, so we can guarantee a minimum yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, capacity for those applications. Yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. thank you. Hi. Uh, one question is about operations. How yeah. was for then adapt from body metal, all Applic uh, Java application format and um, uh, operation level to the cloud with OpenShift and containers. We still uh, we still uh, we still have uh, almost weekly meetings with our operation team just to to get them to transition uh, to start. But it's kind of our problem as well because we haven't had the volumes until now. It's just been something uh, something uh, that they've barely touched. But now they're getting more and more involved with it. Thank you. Are there any other questions? 
not, thank you, Robert. Thank you. Very uh, inspirational. Uh, well done.